Good evening. I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you all so much for joining us for the fourth and final session of this year's Crucial Conversation Series on Confronting Antisemitism. I'd like to start by thanking our generous sponsors for this series, Nancy Ann and Ray L. Hunt in memory of Barbara Rabin, Texas Instruments, Nissan Foundation, City of Dallas Office of Arts and Culture, and IMA Financial Group and IMA Foundation. We are so grateful for your critical support of this museum and this important series. I'd also like to extend our thanks to our community partners for tonight's event. The, it's a long list, so bear with me. AJC Dallas, Anti-Defamation League, Congregation Sheriff Israel, Faith Forward Dallas, Jewish Family Services of Greater Dallas, Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas's Jewish Community Relations Council, Legacy Senior Communities, Mosaic Family Services, Resource Center, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Emmanuel, Temple Shalom, and the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. Thank you all so much for your support and partnership. I'd also like to give a warm welcome to our museum members and our board members joining us tonight. Your support is crucial to our mission. Thank you for all you do. Tonight marks the conclusion of our critical, of our crucial conversation series on confronting antisemitism. Over the last three sessions, we have examined the origins and history of antisemitism and discuss the recent increase in antisemitism globally and in the United States. Tonight, we aim to identify concrete steps that can be taken to confront and disrupt antisemitism. I want to thank everyone watching tonight for your commitment to learning about antisemitism and its consequences, because antisemitism is not just a Jewish problem. We all must stand together against prejudice and hatred in any form. An assault against our fellow citizens is an assault against us all. We will leave tonight, we will leave time tonight for questions at the end of the discussion. So at any time during the program, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your question. Because we have so much to talk about tonight, this program may run a little bit longer than usual, but we are recording the session. So you can always come back to it if you need to step away at any point. It will be on our DHHRN YouTube channel. I am so pleased to have such an esteemed panel with us tonight. I want to leave them as much time as possible. So while I will just introduce them briefly. Holly Huffnagel serves as the American Jewish Committee's U.S. Director for Combating Antisemitism, spearheading the agency's response to antisemitism in the United States and its efforts to better protect the Jewish community. Before coming to AJC, she served as the policy advisor to the Special Envoy to monitor and combat antisemitism at the U.S. Department of State and as a researcher in the Mandel Center of Advanced Holocaust Studies at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Brian Levin is a criminologist, civil rights attorney, and professor of criminal justice and director of the Center for Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University, San Bernardino where he specializes in analysis of hate crime, terrorism, and legal issues. Previously, he served as Associate Director Legal Affairs of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Klan Watch Militia Task Force and Legal Director of the Center for the Study of Ethnic and Racial Violence. Yair Rosenberg is a senior writer at Tablet Magazine where he covers the intersection of politics, culture, and religion. In his writing, he's, he has covered everything from national elections in America and Israel, to observant Jews in baseball, to Muslims and Jews in comic books, to the translation of Harry Potter into Yiddish, and in his spare time, he creates bots that troll anti-Semites on Twitter. 
And our moderator tonight, our own Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, is the Barbara Rabin Chief Education Officer for the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. She is an experienced educator and has researched, taught, and written on Jewish culture and history. She speaks regularly on the Holocaust, topics in Jewish history and culture, and the history covered in the museum's core and special exhibitions. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Sarah and our esteemed panel to begin the discussion. Sarah. Thank you, Mary Pat, for, for a very nice introduction. Uh, and thank you, Brian and Holly and Yair for joining us this evening uh, for what I hope will be uh, a very interesting conversation and an enlightening conversation as well. So, Tonight, we're gonna to talk about confronting anti-Semitism, combating anti-Semitism, disrupting anti-Semitism, you know, choose your modifier there. But the bottom line is we're gonna talk about practical strategies. And I think it's extremely important to have this conversation because I think a lot of people have a pretty good sense of what anti-Semitism is when they see it uh, or they hear it or they read about it but then they're left not knowing what to do next. Um, and, and that is the challenge. So let's start with a very general uh, question that I will uh, throw out to all of you. And I'm gonna do it in the Brady Bunch order that I see your square. So uh, I'll ask Brian first, Holly second, and Yair uh, third, and then we'll go from there. So, so the opening question is, what does it mean to combat anti-Semitism? And, and what is the goal? Because I don't think it's necessarily as simple as, as a lot of people think. So Brian, can we start with you? You're muted. <laughs> as I said earlier, my son doesn't trust me with the remote either, but thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And, and let me just also uh, thank your, your, your wonderful work that you're doing uh, in, in Texas. And also, if I may, we have such a wonderful panel uh, outside of me. I want to just uh, thank uh, my co-panelists as well for the, just the phenomenal work uh, that they do. I have been a fan for some time. Anyway, um, you know, it's interesting because I do a lot of analysis on the hate crime area, but I think we have to do a couple of things in addition to that. And one of them starts with what you're doing. Education is so important. Just think for a second, what if we didn't have the firewall of, uh, of entities like yours uh, in actually different cities uh, across the country? We just gave uh, Richard Hirschhout an award. Uh, he started the uh, Holocaust uh, Museum uh, in uh, Illinois. And when we're seeing people trivial trivializing it, uh, people who should know better, by the way, at, 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 at county meetings and public health discussions, all the way through just ignorance about who Jews are and what they do. It is so important to have that educational counterweight. So what I would say is the first step is education. Second step is, you know what, Jewish folks, let's go out there and make allies because the great thing about our faith and our practice of it is that in a civilized pluralistic democracy, not only do Jews thrive, but society thrives as well. So tying it to allies. And the third thing that I'll say is making sure that law enforcement responds appropriately. Uh, interesting enough, I just, if I, if I can, and I'll shut up and let the, the, the wonderful co-panelists that we have, just looked up the latest Texas hate crime data. Texas, and this is all preliminary, so if it comes out a little different later, uh, don't write your congressperson. Um, year to date through July, up 42% from 256 last year to 364 overall hate crime. Dallas um, overall hate crime uh, up from 22 to 24, um, same period last year. But interestingly, I think Dallas needs to do a better job. They counted zero anti-Semitic hate crimes in both periods. So we have to work with our partners in law enforcement and in social media and other entities to make sure that not only do we have allies within the community, but also allies with respect to uh, institutions uh, who might need help from educational uh, groups 
like, like yours and our co-panelists who are just so wonderful. And thank you so much for having me, by the way. Thank you, Brian. I, I would add to your, your uh, quick statistical analysis that uh, Texas and California go back and forth for the number one uh, spot in terms of the total number of, um, of um, hate, hate groups uh, located in the state. And I'm not sure if we're number one or number two right now. So We're happy to take number two this time, but uh, with uh, Texas teams in the World Series, we'd like to take number one. We'll see, Holly. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Sarah. And and Bri I think Brian actually hinted at a few things that we should dive in a little bit deeper later in the conversation with hate crime, with some things on social media, with law enforcement. Uh, but just to to broaden it out a bit on um, what does it actually mean to to combat uh, and and what is the goal and. I should also offer my thanks to the, the Dallas Holocaust uh, and Human Rights Museum before I even go there. So Sarah, thank you for the invitation and, and to my co-panelists as well. Um, but we often refer, and you just done this series. So I think many of us on this call know that anti-Semitism has been referred to as the longest hatred. And you just explored why and, and, and how, and the 2000 years of, of history related to anti-Semitism, which means that combating it, um, combating something that's both ancient and contemporary means that I think the goal is, is, is lowering the level, right? Like we're not going to eradicate it completely. We won't solve it, but how do we lower the level? So when I think of combating, I really think of, of just two things, of two things. The first is reinstating the taboo. So I think many, you know, even older Jewish Americans um, were affected by, or remember um, the pervasive discrimination against Jews in housing in our country uh, and in higher education, discrimination in employment, even hotel accommodations, club, club memberships. And those restrictions have, have disappeared. And we actually saw anti-Semitism like kind of go to the fringes of American society for some time. And I think one thing we need to focus on now is how do we reinstate that taboo? How do we make sure that those who say things that are anti-Semitic really do become a social pariah and are ostracized? Again, it goes back to the fringes. And then the second thing is something I like to refer to as, as Jewish community resilience, which sounds much better than combating anti-Semitism. Because I think when we look at this as a battle, and we often do, we use the language about fighting and combating and, um, but you know, soldiers get get tired, and wars can't be waged, you know, constantly forever. And so I think when we think about this as building resilience and building Jewish communal pride and, and identity, so when anti-Semitic incidents happen, the community can anticipate it and adapt quickly, but still um, not just survive, but thrive and remain strong. And I think that really is kind of a, a slap in the face, if you will, uh, to the anti-Semites. Okay, thank you. And Yair. Thank you so much. Uh, the trouble with going after two excellent panelists is that they've already covered most of the answer to the question before I get to it. Um, I, wanted, I also wanted to thank uh, you guys for having me. I just wish it could have been in person. I've been to Dallas once before in high school for a debate tournament at Yavne Academy of Dallas, actually. Um, and I would love, love, love to come back. And I hope that that's the sort of thing that will be possible sooner rather than later. Um, so yeah, no, and I think, you know, Holly really stepped on my toes in terms of uh, combating anti-Semitism by explaining that when people say things like fighting it or defeating it, um, I don't think that's the frame that you want. Um, this is something that is so old and it is rooted in some very fundamental uh, human failings. Um, mm -hmm. Jews are this perpetual minority that's been discriminated against um, throughout history and time. Um, and it's a little bit, I think, uh, uh, foolhardy to think that you're going to defeat something that's really based on the you know, human ability, inability to tolerate difference, to tolerate the other. Um, what you can do, as she said, is you can mitigate it. Um, you can recognize we're not going to defeat this. It's, a, it's, a, it's based in some really uh, deep human issues, uh, but we can limit its impact. We can reestablish norms that keep the people who express it uh, more on the fringe of society. I do some, I try to work on that in terms of social media sometimes. Um, but another thing that we can do is sort of recognize what are the human failings that lead to anti-Semitism and find ways, minimize the number of people who are, fall prey to them and also quarantine the people who do. Um, so what do I mean by that? So uh, people with a conspiratorial mindset, people who are susceptible to conspiracy theories uh, because anti-Semitism in its way is one of the world's oldest conspiracy theories. It believes that Jews are these secret string pullers behind the scenes, manipulating all world events and responsible for all the problems. Um, 
that's not in itself, uh, you know, that's a very old and deep, you know, way of thinking about the world. And anyone who's prone to looking for a hidden hand to explain in a very simple way how the world works is going to inevitably land on Jews as the people to blame, right? If you believe that there is an invisible hand uh, that's responsible for all of the issues in the world, you'll eventually realize that that hand belongs to an invisible Jew. It's just sort of this iron law of conspiracy theories because if you start Googling around to try to figure out who's behind stuff, there's hundreds of years of material in anti-Semitic literature that's there to tell you that person is the Jews. Um, and so the more a society becomes you know, susceptible and traffics in conspiracy theories, um, the more susceptible it is to anti-Semitism, the more people are raised to think of the world in a complex way and to recognize that things are not nearly as simple um, and to engage with the world as it is, the less likely they'll fall prey to people who peddle anti-Semitism. Uh, that's a tall order, but at least it gives you something to work with. Um, so that's one of the things that I would I would say is essential to this uh, endeavor. So, yeah, you know, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're, you're, in essence, you're saying that that it isn't just anti-Semitism; it's conspiracy theory more generally. Um, it's it's demonization of the other. It's a, it's it's this whole kind of package of of human foibles that gets that gets triggered. By, by something like anti-Semitism. So then anti-Semitism isn't particularly a Jewish problem. It's, it, it is everybody's problem, I think, as, as, as Mary Pat said in her opening remarks. So let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Um, let's start by, by talking about whether or not anti-Semitism has to rise to a particular level before we need to attempt to educate, educate against it, work toward allyship, uh, make sure that, that law enforcement uh, responds appropriately. I'm, I'm using you know, some, of, some of Brian's um, uh, descriptions there. Uh, or is it something that no matter what level it's at, even if it's very, very minor, it's, it, it's something that we need to, to nip in the bud. And uh, this one I'll open to all three of you because I think all of you work in this area. So. I'm gonna go first before oh, they okay. can all steal my okay, thunder. Go, go first, Jair, um, go first. <laughs> uh, I'll put them in my position. Uh, so I, I think that uh, that's a great, it's a great question um, because um, people often try to ask all sorts of, uh, apply to all, all sorts of tests to decide how to prioritize which anti-Semitism is worse or which one to fight and so on. And in a certain sense, of course, you have to do that because you only have limited resources. Uh, but I think in practice, a lot of the time, uh, People use this as a way of avoiding anti-Semitism they don't want to talk about uh, and talking only about the anti-Semitism they want to talk about. So I'll say, well, you know, one, one person's fringe is another person's mainstream, right? And so you talk to, um, a, you know, a, a uh, Republican and they're more likely to tell you, well, there's a serious anti-Semitism problem uh, in the Democratic Party among people who despise Israel, who then lapse into anti-Semitism. And then you try to raise anything going on within the Republican coalition, right? Anything related to right-wing politics, anything that Donald Trump might've said. And these people will say, but yeah, but like, that's like a, an exception or it's a bad apple, right? But the other side, it's, it's, it's rife. Uh, and then, of course, if you go to the other side and you go to progressives, they will say the exact same thing, of course, about the Republicans. Um, and of course, I could spend 20 minutes here telling you what my opinion is on who's right and exactly what proportions they are. And I think it would be a largely useless conversation for a bunch of reasons. Um, but what's really going on when you have that debate is that you're having people arguing over anything but actually arguing with the anti-Semites. Right? These people aren't dealing with anti-Semites. They're attacking each other and using anti-Semitism as their tool. Um, and the much more effective thing people can do is not try to figure out um, what's the exceptional anti-Semitism and what's the rule. It's to say, where is there anti-Semitism near me in my own community um, that I have the ability to impact? Uh, because of course we have the most influence over our friends, over our allies, over our communities, over ideological, you know, our ideological, uh, uh, you know, uh, coalition partners. Um, we have very little influence over the people who we already despise and disagree with. Um, but most people are constantly like crashing other ideological parties and trying to bounce anti-Semites from them and then being surprised and shocked when this doesn't work. Um, but if you've ever tried crashing some party you weren't invited to and tried to bounce people from it, you would understand why this doesn't work. Um, and so what I really think it, we would do is think less about, uh, you know, which anti-Semitism is higher or lower and say which anti-Semitism is closer. Okay. All right. That makes, that makes good sense. Holly, Brian. I'll just quickly add to to air, and I'll then I'll turn it over to to Brian to to close this 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 question out. Um, 
I agree that about where it's closer, you know, that we're going to have the most influence on people who, who trust us, who we share similar values with, um, who we're similar to, like that's who we're going to be able to convince. And so that was a a really, really important point for us to kind of take home um, in the fight against anti-Semitism. I, when asked this question, I actually usually say that it does have to be fought at all levels. You know, is there, is there, is there anti-Semitism too small that you shouldn't say something? And I think the reason why we say, no, you should call that out is we don't want anti-Semitism to become normalized in, in, our, in our society. So I think that the, the highest level, of course, um, that, that, that necessi- necessitates a, an immediate response, of course, is uh, violent physical attacks against Jews. I mean, even fatal attacks. This is, has to have an outpouring of you know, demanding a response, uh, making sure the perpetrator is, is brought to justice, showing how seriously our legal system takes anti-Semitism, increasing Jewish community security, um, ensuring that the government helps fund Jewish communal security and that it's not left up to the Jewish community to, to, to raise all of their own funds. Um, so that's like the highest level. But I think when it comes to you know images, words, um, symbols, phrases, things that we, you know, maybe they don't rise to that level of an attack, like a physical attack, we still have to call that out as as well because you know from history we know that it doesn't start with what, what starts with words doesn't necessarily end with words and really showing that there is no place for anti-Semitism in our in our society having that strong civil society um, mechanism that, that kind of pushes back against that and I think we saw a recent case even um, and and I do agree that there is sometimes double standards with anti-Semitism versus other forms of racism when some think someone says something racist versus anti-Semitic in the same workplace at the same time the anti-Semitism might not warrant a, a bigger or as, as high of a punishment versus someone who says something racist. And we, we do want to make sure that that's equal. But what happened with um, Myers Leonard with the Miami Heat, professional basketball player, he, he said an anti-Semitic slur while live streaming um, a, a video game and he was fined $50,000. He was traded. I mean, there was there was repercussions for, for saying something anti-Semitic. And that's what we kind of need is that 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 civil society, society response mechanism. Um, the last thing I'll say, though, is a, a lot of the anti-Semitism, not, mo- not all of it, and maybe not even most of it, but a lot of it we, we see today does come from a place of ignorance. And that doesn't mean that that's okay. it's okay. There, there's ways to educate. There's ways to call out appropriately. But I don't think shaming um, is always an appropriate response. In fact, it can cause people to double down, to, to be unsure, to maybe even like you know Jews less if, if, if we're only, only publicly shame. And so I do think it's really important to be careful with, with how we call it out, how we don't overuse the term. There's not anti-Semitism under every rock. Not everyone who says something anti-Semitic is an anti-Semite. We need to be careful with how we label people. And it's a it's a bludgeon. It's a word that should carry weight. It points toward genocide. And we I think we've overused it a little bit. Um, and it's finding that balance uh, today and, and making sure that it, it, it carries that carries that weight. Okay. Right. This is terrible. I, I, um, I had the same feeling 30 years ago when I had to go after uh, John Lewis and a, a preacher from Western North Carolina. But uh, um, I, I, agree, I agree with them all. Um, you know, I, Holly stole my thunder on this one because I, I wanted to make two uh, designations here. Uh, the first is, you know, there are certain things that we have to do with regard to anti-Semitism that are monumentally important, but not necessarily urgent. Uh, and let me explain. We wanna, we wanna uh, build uh, Holocaust and genocide museums. We wanna make sure that we have these wonderful kind of documentaries. You are, you're wonderful. Um, but we had during the, uh, the month of May, a terrible rise that is sustained in anti-Semitic violence. So one of the things I'm saying is, you know, before I'm going to work on the sucker right now, I want to get, uh, I, I want to make sure that we have a whole society approach to responding to these catalytic uh, kind of uh, events that happen. Just give me, if you could give me just one second. I think this is so fascinating. We took just about three decades of FBI data and we broke it down not only by group, by day and by month. And I want to also compliment uh, uh, James Nolan and a, and a whole team of folks, John Reitzel and uh, Annalisa um, uh, Vinolia, all these folks who helped us with this. Um, what we found, interesting stuff, listen to this, the worst month for uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes in the United States by decade, March 1994, 
happened after the, the Hebron massacre. And we had a terror murder in New York of, of uh, a young, innocent yeshiva student. That was a terrorist attack. Uh, then October 2000, we saw it again. Listen to this, though. Uh, that was uh, um, around the, the Intifada time. But uh, most recently, the worst months were, um, bear with me, November of 2018 for volume, but October of 2018 for the worst month for anti-Semitic homicides since we've been recording data. And what did, what did it show? So conflicts in the Middle East, and what else? Politics here in the United States. One last thing that I told the Senate uh, today be, before they, uh, uh, they, they moved on to working on other stuff was when, when we look now, we're seeing politics play a role. And sometimes it's not even just targeted towards Jews, but all the ships go up. In November 2016, that was the wor election month. That was the worst month for hate crime across the board, uh, going back to this, uh, the, the first anniversary of 9-11. And the day after the elections was the worst day uh, for all hate crime, going back to um, uh, June uh, to, uh, 2003. So sometimes we get boosted up in a negative way, in other words, spotlighted, um, when it's merely just um, something that's kind of directly related to Jewish people, right? But other times it's when the, the whole prejudice shift, uh, the, 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 uh, the waters lifting all, all the prejudice shifts. But specifically, give an example, in New York, we, we know this, we know this happens. And during the, the recent uh, violent conflict in the Holy Land, uh, new NYPD was supposed to uh, get more personnel into those areas that we know have been hit before and they were delayed. And it wasn't because they were, uh, were mean or anti-Semitic, it was implementing it. It didn't go all the way uh, across the chain. So I, I think we have to make sure that when something terrible is happening and Jews are being attacked on the streets, let me, if, if, I, if I can, just give me one second, uh, because yeah, we have such wonderful co-panelists. I don't want to be the schnoor that took everybody else's time. But listen, listen to this. We had almost as many, just by one, um, hate crimes in three weeks in May in New York City. Then we had the whole first quarter. And indeed, uh, three quarters, uh, about two thirds or three quarters of the anti-Semitic hate crimes in New York were in, this, uh, in the second quarter. Similarly, Los Angeles, bottom line is that's something, I mean, I wanna make sure we respond to when people are most fearful and we see these attacks going on. Then on a separate track, all the things that our wonderful uh, co-panelists mentioned, and I'm gonna be quiet now because I wanna hear the, the rest of what they're gonna say. So this actually leads into my next question, which relates to when does anti-Semitism spike and why? Um, and what you've just given here, Brian, is, is some very, very recent examples, but anti-Semitism isn't new. Um, and anti-Semitism in the United States isn't something that's new. I mean, it's, it's, it's wrapped up with, with some, of the, some of the Quaker foundings in colonial Pennsylvania, for example. I mean, it goes back to our origins um, in, in, in different uh, uh, forms, as does going back to a little bit later in our origins, you know, Washington's lovely uh, return address to, to, the, to the Newport Synagogue, where he basically says, conduct yourselves as citizens and, and you'll be Americans like everybody else to, to this, to this uh, Jewish group uh, uh, that, that gives him this uh, address. So I, I guess my question is, what does cause these spikes and why in the American context can we not keep this kind of out of the public sphere or out of the the kind of the the, the sub-public mutterings of people because it never really goes away it's always there on some level um, and and so I'm, I'm I'm asking that and then and then we'll move next to talking about how to how to begin to take it apart on on ser a different series of levels yeah I I want to talk about this because actually it's something I've been thinking about a lot um, in terms of the words we use to describe what you know, causes anti-Semitism. 
Uh, because if you listen to uh, Brian's data there, and I'd love to see some more of that actually, because it's very interesting. Uh, so he's looking through the data and saying historically, actually we get spikes in anti-Semitic hate crimes uh, based on when there is conflict um, among Israelis and Palestinians or in the Middle East, depending on when you're looking at it. Um, and you know, there's actually, it was long assumed that actually that's what happened in Europe, but it didn't happen in America. So this would suggest it's actually happening in America too. Um, but I hesitate, even though it's totally natural for us to use the word cause, even though that seems intuitive, saying, oh, X thing happened in Israel and therefore it caused an anti-Semitism spike in the United States. Uh, but that didn't really cause the spike, right? That's what you would call a proximate cause if you're using technical language. It's the immediate thing that triggers the other thing. But what's the root cause of somebody in Brooklyn beating up a random Jew over something that other Jews allegedly did thousands of miles away in the Middle East? The root cause of that is an anti-Semitic mentality that says that all Jews are collectively accountable for what any other Jew might do, right? That's the racist mentality. That is true when people attack Muslims in New York over the actions of Muslims in the Middle East. And it's true when people attack Black people one place because they had a bad experience um, with a Black person or a member of another minority somewhere else. I think we've all met such people in our lives, unfortunately. Um, and so that's the real cause. That's the root cause. The root cause is the prejudice mentality, the inability to treat minority groups uh, as individuals, uh, to treat them as we would treat ourselves um, and expect ourselves not to be lumped in with anybody else who happens to look like us or share some other characteristic with us. Um, and so I would say that, yes, the proximate cause of, of some of these spikes is particular events. But if you only pay attention to the proximate cause, then people start saying things like, well, if Israel didn't do X, right, then people would stop being anti-Semitic. But it isn't true. Right, because it's not the fundamental cause, it's not the root cause. Um, it's actually just the pretext. And when that pretext goes away, they will come up with a new one. Because historically, you know, Jews were attacked because they were, for example, untrustworthy minorities uh, who were seen as uh, no, citizens of no country and therefore loyal only to themselves. So then they got together and they made their own country. And now they're attacked because they have that country and they're all secretly working for it, right? So you can't win, right? You know. It used to be that in Europe, you know, Christian anti-Semites would attack random Jews because allegedly thousands of miles away at another time, Jews killed Jesus in the Middle East. And now today people will go and attack Jews in the streets of Europe because other Jews thousands of miles away in the Middle East did something violent or attacked a Palestinian, right? And like, it's the exact same thing. They just come up with a new way to recycle it because it's the root cause that's the problem. And that's the root cause that needs to be combated. The proximate causes aren't the real issue. Right. They could be like, for example, if you ask me about my Israel politics, I think Israel should be doing a bunch of different things because I have disagreements with Israeli government policy. But I am not deluded into thinking that any of that would substantially affect the reality or the history or the continuity of anti-Semitism. The only thing I'll add to Yair, because I think he summed it up very nicely looking at root causes. That's what we have to go, whether it be economic root causes, whether it be a growing kind of disenfranchised with government's ability to govern. So we have a lot of anti-Semitism related to anti-government movements, growing a liberalism, growing populism, growing wokeism to use, you know, the, uh, the social media. I mean, these are all causes that have led to the increases of anti-Semitism, in, in addition to what Brian aptly mentioned about elections, about um, violence in the Middle East, about around Jewish holidays. I would actually even add even Christian holidays. We still have around Easter some traditional Christian anti-Judaism coming up. Um, but one thing I do want to say, because Sarah, you asked about America um, and, and, and anti-Semitism here, that sometimes I do think it's important to remember that um, the, the advancement of, of civil equality under the law for Jews following the Revolutionary War really did help ensure that government-sponsored anti-Semitism and some of the deep-rooted anti-Semitism that we saw in Europe really did not take place here. I mean, it, it, it's it, there, were, there is anti-Semitism. We know Jews were discriminated against. We're seeing this rise now, um, but it is a little, it is a different circumstance. And I, and I think for the better, which, but we have lessons from Europe that we need to pull from in, make, in order to make sure that it doesn't rise to the levels that we've seen there. Brian, anything you want to add, having started this one? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, first, you know, this is something I've never been able to do, which is uh, find my keys, my glasses, remote, or my data. But what's, what's nice is we made it into a little heat map. So you can actually see when, look at the reds, you know, uh, 2018, right? Um, and and uh, by the way, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's uploaded on, on, on my, uh, my Senate testimony, if, if folks want to see it. Or you know what I'll do? I'll put it on Twitter like in the next couple of days uh, at, at, uh, at Prof. Levin. But 
uh, Dr. Robin Williams from Cornell, not not the uh, not the comedian we all loved, uh, had some uh, had something that I thought was very interesting. He said there's a printed circuit of stereotypes that label certain people as legitimate targets for aggression, and when you have the oldest prejudice out there, uh, I, I I think uh, our co pounds are totally right. You know, I don't really talk about this uh, that much because I was more confused when this happened. But when I was in like uh, I think third or fourth grade. Uh, during um, uh, April, I was visiting uh, the, the South Bronx and went to, uh, you know, went to a little basketball court and a bunch of kids like chased after me. Uh, you know, they, uh, they asked I was Jewish. So I said, sure. And they said, you killed Christ. And, 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 and they, they almost beat the daylights out of it. Uh, but uh, I, I was so confused. I was like, uh, I, I don't know these folks. Yeah. Um, but there is this printed circuit of stereotypes uh, about Jews. And one of the things that we've seen, um, uh, there are a couple of professors from Northeastern University, Jack Levin, no relation, uh, and, and Jack McDevitt came up with this strata of hate offenders. Now just bear with me, because not everyone's committing a crime, but you get the idea, different levels of, uh, of uh, different depths of prejudice. One thing that we know about prejudice is an attitude and it has three components. Uh, the informational, uh, the emotional, and then the behavioral. And, and what we've seen, for instance, is we used to see a lot of thrill offenders. And they were young people with shallow stereotypes, but they were seeking more peer validation almost uh, than other things. Um, those folks have fallen by the wayside. We're now seeing oftentimes an older and more violent uh, type, uh, type of attacker. Uh, so, so, so that's something. But with regard to those that don't commit hate crimes, um, there's still a level of prejudice that allows them to have some comfort with expressing this within, within their, uh, their, their social groups and subcultures. And what I think is so interesting today, and just, just bear, bear with me, it's going to be short. The way that anti-Semitism mutates off of numerous tributaries. So for instance, you know, people are like, well, QAnon, what the heck is that? Most recently, what we've seen uh, both in our research and our friends uh, over at National Contagion Research Institute, um, uh, has, has QAnon has, has, has kind of like uh, fragmented and some of it is uh, about COVID restrictions that are being renewed and we're seeing that coming up again, right? Some of it is anti-Semitism, you know, uh, Jews, started, Jews started COVID or sometimes they say, no, Jews didn't start it, the Asians started it. So we'll beat them up, but Jews are making all the money off of it, this kind of thing. So we're seeing like QAnon become like this kind of elastic vehicle along with grievance overall. And when there's institutional grievances, just bear with me, when you see a decline, as I said today uh, at the Senate, when you see this decline in, in trust in the institutions that hold us together, what is the, you know, who is the boogeyman for eons? The Jews, they're the ones controlling things. So when people are unhappy with what's going on in the world and they distrust institutions, th this is unfortunately what we have, which is why, if I may, thank you so much for what you're doing in Dallas. It is so, so important. And Holly and Yair, thank you so much because that is part of the firewall. The, at least getting the information, if they wanna, you know, they wanna mess with it, there's nothing you can do. There are people who, who think that COVID's a hoax. But at least having that firewall uh, as, as part of an anchoring structure uh, with the communal institutions. One of those things are the educational realm, but that's so important. And, and, and again, uh, all my co-panelists, thank you so much for what you're doing because it's all part of how, how we respond to that last point. When you have, uh, especially today, we have this, as I said, this elastic pool of grievance. But what happens is, People accept villainy behind it uh, more easily when they're stressed, and then there's a rabbit hole that, that, that it continues down. Okay, so we've talked about parameters, we've talked about some, some elements of history, um, we've talked about levels that things have to attain or not attain before we respond. 
So the next natural outgrowth of this is what is response? What, sh what should we be doing? And I I'd like to take you through this on a series of levels. So I guess my first question would be, what should our response be to policy, uh, anti-Semitism on a policy level? And, and, you know, international, federal, state, local, and I don't care which level you address. Um, I think I would ask actually that we start at the local level. Let's start as, as you were talking about before, where we all live, what's right in front of us. So how do we as individuals or as members of organizations begin to, to stop anti-Semitism um, or respond to anti-Semitism on a policy level locally, and then let's let's say nationally and internationally. Um, Holly, let's start with you this time. I'm glad we started with the local because I actually think that um, the local is some not always removed from politics, but I do think that partisan politics maybe play less of a role where where people may look to their mayors as you know, at least maybe having some, you know, moral courage, maybe caring about this, their citizens, not caring who's Republican or Democrat to fix potholes in the street. Um, and, and we've recognized this actually, uh, working with the American Jewish Committee, we partnered with the US Conference of Mayors, uh, knowing that really they're on the first lines of defense in their own communities and, and doing trainings with them on anti-Semitism, teaching them how to speak out against anti-Semitism. And that's, this is really the, the most important. Uh, for the citizens themselves, though, and I think that's a question that we get a lot in this in this field is well what can I do you know I'm at the local level but so what can I do I don't really make a difference just myself and I think if everyone asked that and no one did anything we really wouldn't get very far um, so one we I usually refer to about five things that um, individuals at the local level can do and the first is is and these aren't you know um, novel ideas but I think they're important to, to mention and, and, and have a kind of a strategy even behind them so the first is you know, speaking out and, and raising awareness. It sounds so simple, but you're uh, be amazed to know how many people actually really don't speak out or uh, don't don't share what they're um, they're experiencing because they don't feel confident in knowing how to describe it, um, how to explain anti-Semitism, how to say that this what happened actually um, in, in Israel is is affecting you know Jewish employees in the workplace where they're asked to, to explain Israel, where no other employees asked to defend or explain another state, why that's problematic and. Um, we, I think at the organizational level, have those tools to give to individuals. I know uh, the museum has a toolkit on anti-Semitism, like use that as an individual, share it, um, put it on your social media pages, et cetera. The second thing is, is be an active citizen and really engage with your elected members of, of, of Congress. I mean, so many of us, I think we've, um, not that, uh, that, that civics is, is, is lost. I actually think we need to have a, re, you know, a reinvigoration of civics and civic education in our country. What does it mean to, to call up your mayor, to call up your state representative, to call your member of Congress and say, take these issues seriously and really you know, be an active and, and engaged citizen? The, um, just a, a few more at the local level. And I'll, I'll actually stop at the local. I have federal and international as well, but I think it might be helpful just to focus on the individuals at first. Uh, the, the third is reporting. Um, and, and Brian, I think you might corroborate me on this, is there are major gaps in, in reporting and it's a two part street. It's, it's the individual having to report. It's also law enforcement having to properly collect the data and I, ideally give it to the FBI. There's a lot of holes in local law enforcement actually tr giving their hate crimes data, their anti-Semitism submitted hate crimes data to, to law enforcement. But we've done studies actually on American Jews. AJC's done a study on American Jewish attitudes and perceptions with anti-Semitism. And we found that, you know, 76% of Jews in the last five years who experienced anti-Semitism didn't report it. So, so three, three, three to four American Jews who had an issue didn't actually report it. They didn't report it to the security, um, the, the secure community network, SCN or even ADL. Like they didn't even report to a Jewish organization, let alone the police or even online, like to the platforms themselves. And so that's a problem because it means that, you know, whether they don't think anything will change, that's resigning, that's resigning in the fight against anti-Semitism, or uh, they don't think it's a big enough deal. And I hear that a lot. Oh, it was just a slur. Oh, it was just a joke. Like, it wasn't a big enough deal. And I think we can we can move toward normalization if we if we think it's not a big enough deal. We want to prevent that as well. So, so report, report, report. Uh, the the fourth is um, um, providing like our own resources. So, you know, whether it means like our time, 
our money, like funding, um, you know, Jewish community security projects, uh, funding new initiatives, volunteering time in local classrooms, explaining what does it mean to be Jewish, explaining history, Jewish life, like these kinds of engagement opportunities actually are really important and go a long way. And then the last thing I'll mention at the local level is, is the partnership with others piece. Uh, we've really seen, at least at a national level, human relationships frayed over the last few years. And even just in the last, even since May, just some of the times with our Muslim Jewish partners and um, even this past year, even with our black Jewish partners, like really needing to, to rebuild those, those relationships um, because we actually have data. We have data that shows that, um, we, that when we ask non-Jews if someone who was Jewish or a Jewish organization uh, explain something as anti-Semitic, would that make you more or less likely to also think of it as anti-Semitic? And 65% of Americans said it wouldn't make a difference if a Jewish person or a Jewish organization said something was anti-Semitic. And 7% actually said it would make them less likely to think. So we know, and we have to do a little more research on why that is, but we do know that when non-Jews speak out against anti-Semitism, like when it's a you know, Muslim imam combating anti-Semitism in, in like the mosque, or when it's um, a black Jewish leader or you know, speaking out against the the you know you know Farrakhan and and anti-Semitism with the Nation of Islam, or when it's a a white uh, Christian evangelical pastor, you know, um, decrying QAnon or or saying that you know this is not okay, like that's actually going to go much further. And that happens at the local level. That happens in the communities, um, which I think are really the unit of social change. So I'll, I'll pause there in the local. Yeah, you're. Sure. Uh, the local level, I also agree, is actually the one that more interests me because I feel like it's not the stuff that, of course, makes headlines. Uh, the stuff that makes headlines is the uh, debates that people have on much uh, higher up on um, the uh, national uh, and uh, state level, but th those have limited returns. Uh, but the things that are closer to you, as we said earlier, are often the things you have the most impact on. Um, I would say two additional things uh, to think about on the local level when thinking about anti semitism So one is jumping off something Holly said, which is, uh, she said it very briefly, but uh, there are a lot of anti-Semitism uh, stuff that we do is reactive uh, rather than proactive. It's about responding to something that's already gone wrong, which is, you know, you have to do it, but it's already a failure. Um, what you really want is for people to have lines of connections to Jewish people, to have had interactions with Jewish people, and to have some knowledge of Jewish people, so that they will be less susceptible to caricatures and demonization and lies about Jewish people. Uh, and how do you do that? Um, so one obvious one is education, right? So uh, that can be in terms of curriculums. How can you make a good curriculum that teaches people about uh, Jews? So one is uh, not restricting what the curriculum talks about in terms of anti-Semitism to say the Holocaust. Um, a good curriculum that uh, is about anti-Semitism has the Holocaust as a component, uh, but it's not the totality. Uh, and I'm, I, know, I recognize that I'm saying this to a Holocaust museum, but I think you guys actually know this from your own mission, uh, which is that it has to be put in a broader context. Um, and moreover, if you only teach about the Holocaust, which can come from a very well-meaning place, I am the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. I really appreciate that this education exists. Um, but think about it. If you taught racism simply by teaching about slavery, what you've really done is teach people that racism is some ancient uh, prejudice that was perpetrated by people a long time ago that I don't relate to, and that doesn't really impinge on my life today. Um, and that's actually not true, right? And most racism doesn't look like slavery, but it's all real there, and it's still there today with us. Um, and most anti-Semitism doesn't look like the Holocaust, even if it might have contributed to it. Uh, but through the centuries, there was a lot of anti-Semitism and only a very short period of time was it the Holocaust. Um, and people need to know that it's still there, right? And it's still a real living force. Um, and so teaching Holocaust education in the context of an anti-Semitism education uh, would be, I think, a really good step that uh, more places might, often, might think about locally. Um, that's um, specifically talking head on about anti-Semitism. But one of the things you can do that's I found quite effective uh, but people don't think of it as anti-Semitism education at all. You have to even convince people that it is, but it seems to me very obviously that it is, uh, is enabling people to meet and encounter Jewish people and hear about what it means to be Jewish. Uh, because of course, Jews are only 2% of the United States population. And unless you live on a coast, you're likely not able to meet one. Um, they're even less, they're a fraction of a percent, obviously around the world. So the average person, um, as Holly alluded to, is, uh, is, can be very ignorant about Jews. Um, and that's not because they're a bad person, it's because we're all ignorant about people we've never met in communities we've never encountered. Um, so how do you fill in that blind spot? So actually in St. Louis, the JCRC has a very interesting program that they've been doing for decades now, uh, where they would send um, elementary school kids, uh, junior high kids, and they'd train them to speak about 
you know, Judaism and to answer questions about this. And this is a pluralistic program. So some of the kids are reform and some of the kids are orthodox and some of the kids are somebody else entirely. And they go and they send them to non-Jewish high schools and they give a presentation about what they do and then and what their lives are like. And then the people, the kids, their peers, non-Jewish peers have asked them questions. Uh, so one that's actually strengthens the Jewish identity of the kids themselves. It's, it's like when the, you know, the Mormon church sends uh, all of the young people on missions for a year. Yes, they are missionizing to other people to hopefully convert some Mormons, but what it's also doing is it deepens your appreciation and understanding of your own faith if you have to explain it to others, right? So it deepens your appreciation and understanding of the Jewish identity if you are going to go and explain it to others um, and get really nice feedback about it. Um, one of the funny stories that one of, I was told about this program is that they went to like a Catholic school and uh, then they followed up and said, so how did, how did it go? And they're like, oh, it's great. The kids uh, still have questions. The thing is some of them want to know how they can convert to Judaism, right? And so, but this is the sort of thing that, you know, can happen when people learn about something they learn about before and they find it really nice. Uh, but it also means that when that person then encounters some sort of bizarre smear about Jewish people, on, say on their social media feeds or hears it in a circle, they're more likely to intervene and they're certainly more likely to be skeptical than and say, but that doesn't match my own personal experience, the people I met. Um, and so I think we need to think of the Jewish community more in terms of what those sorts of programs look like and not just in terms of things that are perhaps reactive or specifically about tackling anti-Semitism and talking about it head on. Because frankly, a lot of people have a lot of depressing things in their lives already and they don't necessarily always want to talk about anti-Semitism. I understand that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's my job, but if I wasn't paid to do it, right, you know, I'd be a movie critic or something. Um, and so uh, we would like to, you know, find ways to just help people have better connections and relations with, with Jewish people themselves. It will be good for the Jews and it will be good for everyone else. Okay. Brian. If you were a movie critic, would you give five stars to Yentl? That's all our audience wants to know. <laughs> but anyway. Never seen it. Never oh seen my it. goodness. Note to self, take your to, to the movies. But um, they're, they're, all, they're all right on target. There are a couple of thoughts that, that I want to throw in just quickly because I know we're, we're getting uh, pressed for time. First thing, I think uh, just what, what my co-panelists who are so wonderful said, personalize it, uh, particularly if it's something uh, that's, I don't, I don't wanna say innocuous because uh, anti-Semitism is not innocuous, but, uh, if the intent is a little different, you know, even uh, Justice Holmes said it, a dog, even a dog knows the difference between being stumbled upon and being kicked. Um, and I think we can use these things as learning opportunity to say, you know what, I, 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 I understand you made that joke, but you know what, um, I'm the grandson of, uh, of, of uh, Holocaust survivors, or in my case of an American, uh, a son of American POW who was captured by the Nazis. You personalize and, and folks go, oh, wow. The other thing that I would say that's really important, and this has been demonstrated by our research, um, and, and uh, I, I think it, it went like national tonight because I, I, I haven't had access to the internet and then all my, uh, my things all filled up, is that one of the things that we saw is the importance of the bully pulpit. You know, like, so for instance, when you have a, a Holocaust Remembrance Day, you don't know, mention Jews, um, and, and, and some and some even worse things. The bully pulpit is so important. So so uh, you know, we, and, and we've done like you know time analysis uh, on, on this. When President Bush, uh, for, uh, 43, um, the, the younger, the younger, uh, uh, six days after 9/11 spoke of tolerance towards Muslims at the Islamic Center of DC. And he made a personal statement. The, these are our, uh, our neighbors, our, you know, our, our, our friends, they, they, they teach and they, they're, they're doctors and they do this and that. This is a terrible thing. It's un-American. Hate crimes against Muslims went down precipitously by the next day. And it, and it declined in, into, into the new year. Um, however, for instance, five days after the terror attack that hit our community in San Bernardino, uh, we already had from the terror attack uh, a big spike from, uh, from about 0.67 uh, average anti-Muslim hate crime per day up for the first 11 months of that year to like two and a half per day. And then, so five days later, candidate Trump says, oh, we're going to have a Muslim ban and Islam hates us and all this kind of stuff. 
hate crimes jumped another 23% above the spike that we had from the terror attacks. Oh, let me say, the correlation from the terror attack. Um, that's something, so the bully pulpit is so important because what it does is we have an anchor, someone who commands an audience, has some level of respect or, or uh, ethical authority saying no. Not only is it wrong, but it's un-American. Religious freedom and tolerance is a hallmark, a foundation, a cornerstone uh, of, of what our country's creed is. That's something too. So personalize it, but also I don't say nationalize it, but but also have it on, on, on another scale. So uh, particularly when there are influencers, whatever that, wherever that may be in whatever region you are, but also on a national and international level uh, to, to, to really speak out against it. Why? Because we know about that printed circuit of stereotypes. And if there's some kind of uh, person, institution, or particularly at the right time when people are paying attention say, no, this is not acceptable. Uh, there, there are uh, a decent amount of people that I think uh, will, will ponder that. Not everybody. You know, I spoke to Abe Foxman uh, just a, a couple of years ago. Uh, actually, we, we were doing this kind of road show for, for a little while on, on, on a wonderful uh, film about Bess Meyerson by a, a brilliant documentarian by, uh, by the name of David Aran. And you know, he said to me this, he, he said similar to what uh, our, our panel said, he said, you know, We'll, ne we'll never get rid of it, but we'll be able to contain it. And I think all these tools that we're talking about tonight are so important. The thing is, don't just keep them in the toolbox. Take them out sometimes. Okay, I have one final question for each of you, and then we're gonna move to audience Q&A. And this final question, I I'm gonna ask you each to give me a sentence or two max. Um, so it's the, the Hillel while standing on one foot kind of thing. Um, the question re relates to social media and the internet. Um, and I guess, how do you fight anti-Semitism when you see it in social media? Um, just one or two sentences on, a, on a suggestions that you might have, or, is it something that, that is beyond our ability at this point to, to kind of shut down? Um, and Brian, let's start with you and then we'll do Holly and then we'll do Yair, okay? All right, real quickly, social media is a cesspool of anti-Semitism, first mm -hmm. of all. So what we have to do is, and, and we have a bill in California, AB 587 by the head of the Jewish caucus, uh, Jesse Gabriel, as well as another bill by assembly person Bloom to start a state of hate commission. And the reason I'm saying this is these social media companies already have policies, they should enforce them. And they should also be transparent with respect to what they're doing about it. Facebook just pulled a plug on NYU researchers. Not good. And if they won't come to terms on it, you know what? We'll regulate you. Good and brief. Holly. I don't know how I'll beat you now, Brian. Um, so this is, I think, one of the biggest questions. I think the future of combating anti-Semitism is actually combating the digitization of the problem. End of sentence right there. So I would have said we need to report it, and we still do need to report to the platforms. But there was a report that was just released um, this week by the Center for Countering Digital Hate that found that 84% on average of the reported anti Semitic social media posts were not acted upon. So, one, we have to fix that on the social media side. Uh, the other piece I'll mention is, is government. Actually, even though we have the First Amendment, our government really can do more. Uh, Brian mentioned at the state level, I'll mention at the federal level, reforming Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which would actually hold tech companies liable if their algorithms promote harmful content. We can work toward that. We can you know, push toward that. And the last thing I'll, I'll just actually set uh, Yair up for, I hope, hopefully he'll mention this, is counter speech, putting out material online on the internet that actually pushes back against anti-Semitism and educates on anti-Semitism. And so Yair, I would add to this, is there anything you can tell us about that you might be involved with that attempts to counter this kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I just started releasing this past Wednesday, the first video of a six video uh, explainer series about anti-Semitism. Each video answers a different question um, about anti-Jewish prejudice. And they're very ground level questions. They're just like we discussed, a lot of people, they're not bad people, but they don't know. And often they're afraid to ask, uh, so in, in a video, you can explain, did anti-Semitism go away after the Holocaust? You can talk about, is criticism of Israel anti-Semitic? You can say, uh, do Jewish people cause anti-Semitism, which we might think is a crazy thing to say, but a lot of people sort of think it. And you have to explain to them why that's not so, uh, like we discussed earlier in this panel. 
Um, and so that's the, the goal of that series is to reach people where they are um, and to use these sorts of medias for a positive good. Um, I would say that there's something that just recently happened with the series that I think uh, puts up a note of caution uh, with the idea that we can we can simply have companies regulate this stuff or we can force them to regulate it and then they will correctly land on all of the correct hate speech. Uh, because the companies do try uh, to regulate hate speech, but they're just really bad at it. So for example, we had a trailer, a preview, shall we say, about for this uh, trailer, a trailer for my series on anti-Semitism. And it features incidents of anti-Semitism in the trailer because we discuss incidents of anti-Semitism in the series and we want to show what it is that we're going to be discussing and grab people's attention. Um, and so you have people, including the Jew, you know, uh, um, recounting how he was beaten up and the slurs that uh, he was subjected to. Like this is an interview that he did on television. It was on TV, it's available on YouTube. And we created a trailer and has these sorts of anti-Semitic incidents obviously in the trailer. Um, and it says now watch our series and learn more, you know, how to, like, how to beat this stuff. Um, Instagram took that trailer down for anti-Semitism because after all, it is anti-Semitism, right? In other words, a lot of these places, a lot of these platforms, even when they're trying to regulate hate speech, they can't distinguish hate speech from people trying to raise awareness and combat hate speech um, because it can look to a very casual observer, such as a minimum wage worker who's paid to moderate the platform in Bangladesh, uh, that it is the exact same thing. Um, and if you say you created an algorithm within this because there's terabytes of data going up every second and you can't possibly have humans look at everything, how is the robot going to be able to tell the difference? Um, and so I would be cautious about the idea that we can rely on tech platforms to do this. I, that's why I focus a lot on things like counter speech. If you wanna see something else that I do, um, because I, which goes back to Holly's idea of establishing norms, but how can you establish norms surrounding anti-Semitism online? Um, one of the ways you can do that is by ridiculing people who believe ridiculous things about Jews and exposing how ridiculous they are. Because anti-Semitic conspiracy theories at their heart are ridiculous. If you can point out how they are and people will laugh at them uh, and people don't like being laughed at and that makes them less likely to express that thing in the future. Um, if you wanna see what that's like, I don't have the time here because I wanna get to your questions. But if you Google how to uh, fight anti-Semitic trolls online, uh, YouTube, you got your Rosenberg, you will find like seven minutes of me at the ADL talking about what I do in this situation. It's much more entertaining, honestly, than when I talk about other things. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Okay. So thank you. Thank, thank you all three. And this is our first question. Uh, this uh, is from a 13 year old uh, Jewish uh, uh, child. And uh, this young person says, a kid a few years ago told me at school that school was like a prison camp and that the teachers were like Nazis and the principal was Hitler. It was minor, but it really made me think and it is still on my mind today. When it happened, I didn't say anything, but now I wish I had. I wanna know what I should say to kids when they say something anti-Semitic because it just keeps happening. And it, that's a tough question. And I think it's a common experience. Um, we, AJC, we have a program for high school students, and I, I know that um, probably eighth grade, uh, seventh grade, so not quite in high school, but we, we do reach high school students, and, and they get the same question, like that they were told this in school, when, when kids, we, we know that when kids learn about the Holocaust, actually sometimes um, there is swastikas, or it, because people think it's cool, it's that idea of prejudice being kind of emotional or behavioral, but not really under fully understanding it. Um, I would actually be honest by saying like that is offensive. You know, this is what this this means to me. Um, Hitler was an, you know killed uh, uh, six six million Jews. I, I'm Jewish. Um, this is this was a genocide, and they kind of uh, maybe not those big words, but just explaining that that that, that was hurtful. And I think that's an important start because um, I think being silent can kind of perpetuate perpetuate some of that. Um, but I, I think this person was right to raise it, and just to know that they're not alone. All right. Um, there is another uh, question that I that I would like to run by all of you, um, and this uh, is uh, in response to something that uh, Holly you said earlier. But any any one of the three of you should can take a whack at this. How specifically do we reinstate the taboo? It seems like whether anti-Semitism is viewed as taboo by larger populations greatly depends on where it comes from. That is, which side of the political spectrum. Jews who protest certain kinds of anti-Semitism are often attacked for their views. Um, so how do we reinstate taboos? 
So that's a, that was a very good observation in that question, which is that whether or not anti-Semitism is taken seriously tends to be, be uh, related to uh, whether it comes from uh, the right people, right? which tends to be the wrong people. So if it's uh, anti-Semitism is the perpetual problem of my enemies, right? It's never actually the problem of my friends or myself. Um, the way you combat that sort of thinking uh, is by grounding your education and your conversation about anti-Semitism in principle instead of partisanship. If calling Jews satanic is wrong, it's, it's wrong, whether it's Robert Bowers, the uh, white supremacist who massacred the Jews at the Tree of Law Synagogue, uh, when he says it, because he did, right? It's also wrong when Louis Farrakhan says it, because he did. Um, and by the way, followers of Louis Farrakhan have also murdered American Jews in recent years. Um, and all of this is stemming from the same ideas. People tend to get very caught up with who said it, right? What was the color of their skin? What was their race? What was their religion? What was their politics? That's all secondary. In fact, that's uh, often a distracting discussion uh, from what is the real issue, which is what is anti-Semitism? And once people are taught to recognize what those things are, they will learn to reject them in any context. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think getting to kids younger before they've been uh, Twitter poisoned and hyper politicized and in general getting to average folks. I think if you spend too much time on social media with people who argue in very partisan and ideological terms because that's what people do on social media, even though the vast majority of people don't do that on social media, they're not even on social media to talk about politics. And most people, most people, for, like give an example, very few people statistically we have data are on Twitter in the first place. And then a fraction of a fraction of the people who are on Twitter actually talk about politics. Uh, but if you try to talk about anti-Semitism with those people, you'll probably often get partisan responses that can make you give up and make you despair because you think there is no way to talk about this that won't be turned into a political football. But when I go and talk to high school kids, that doesn't happen. Um, it's only because a very small hyper-ideological segment that's very loud talks this way that people think this is how most people think. Um, and so if you want to see more of this argument about how to talk about it in terms of principle rather than partisanship, that is the second video of my video series, which will come out this coming Wednesday. Um, but the idea of that video is to say, I can take an end run around this whole conversation. I can share with you a more effective way to think about this. And I think the more people do this, I think most people wanna be fair. People really believe in fairness and having equal standards and they want to treat everyone the same. And they also want to treat all anti-Semites the same. Uh, and you gotta get to them early. You gotta teach them to think about it in these terms uh, before they encounter politics or people who try to twist it for their own agendas. Okay. Next question. What do we do about politicians or our representatives who express anti-Semitic views or promote Holocaust distortion? Uh, Brian, you're up. <laughs> Vote them out. Excuse me? Vote them out. Vote them out. Okay. That, that, that's that's the, the, old, the old standard mm -hmm. of other than voting them out. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but we all know on the national level, both on the left and on the right, um, there's a bunch of just really, I don't know how else to say it, wackadoodle stuff that's coming out relating to COVID and Jews and comparisons to the Nazis and Nazi policy. And I mean, it's really crazy stuff. And ultimately, when the election rolls around, you can vote them out. But in the interim, is there something that can be done? Call them out. <laughs> and, 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 and what I mean, and, and I think there's a really important point. You know, recently some, uh, uh, some major Muslim uh, uh, groups in the UK said, uh, we loathe anti-Semitism. And by the way, we're Muslims and we stand with the Jewish community. I think it is so important to build those alliances. And one of the things I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, uh, when we, those of us who are Jewish, um, could you tell? Anyway. Um, I, when, wanted to, I wanted to point that out to people not realize that Brian went and testified about anti-Semitism in Congress today and wore a tie with stars of David on it, which is just amazing. Well, just I, in I, case I, you had it already knows that, I just wanted to point it out. No, I, 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 say, I saved it for tonight. I wore a red tie and I, oh. I, I saved it for tonight. I wore a red tie and I, I, I love all the Jewish groups the same, but, but I'm a little mad at ADL because uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, who's done su such wonderful stuff on anti-Semitism and uh, uh, social media hate, he wore the same exact outfit I wore. Talk about Should've Now worn, people are going to say we conspired to dress the same. But in any Should of have worn the Star of David time. But but uh, in, in, in all candor though, and 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 thank and, and thank you for asking. I think it's important 
for, for those of us who are Jewish to build those alliances, because I tell you, uh, our center, which is not a, a, a center with respect to anti-Semitism only, although boy, it takes a lot of our, uh, of, of our time. I, 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 I wish uh, uh, that, it, it, that none of these things were occurring, but when you have those alliances, where it's, it, it's across the board when folks of, of uh, stature in, in the moral community, uh, when, when, when uh, Catholic uh, preachers stand with us against the anti -Semitism. that is so important. That is so important. When, when, when the Pope condemns it, and, and when, when, when I worked uh, with uh, my, my friends and neighbors in the Asian American community, in other words, what it shows is that we stand together the, uh, the, certainly anti-Semitism is a distinct problem, of course, but it's also, as I said, it's, it's un-American. And I think when we can get whole groups of folks to stand behind someone, and when we have a mayor who is, um, uh, who is not Jewish stand up against it, and, 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 and church leaders and others, it, it, it really makes a difference. But I think part of that is we have to have those alliances established beforehand. And gosh, let me tell you, AJC, God bless you. Uh, they do so many great things in this area. And there's so many other uh, Jewish groups are doing these great things. We have to stand with other communities. So when the same thing happens to them, they're able, we're able all to stand together. And I, I, I think that sends a message because when you listen to what Ahali said, you know, I know a lot of Americans are like, oh, well, uh, the Jewish uh, group saying it. But, uh, but when, we, when we see that across the board, it's really important. And that's why, by the way, I thank, I thank the, all the Jewish organizations. Uh, I, I try never to turn down a, a talk uh, before, uh, particularly like regional and local ones, because it's so important for like a center that is not strictly about anti-Semitism to stand up about it and, to, and also give that information, build that firewall with as many, uh, uh, as many panels as you can. Sarah, if I could just jump in yes. on your original question, because I think Brian set this up beautifully. One thing that we do at AJC when it comes to politicians saying atrocious things on, on uh, social media, yes, we call them out. We have to call them out. But one thing that we can do as an organization, but also as an individual, you know, you can contact your own, whether it's a member of Congress or contact who you know. And if it's, especially if it's in within that party, that's the most power, powerful. And Yair already mentioned this, like you listen to your friends, you listen to those like you. If the Democrats are gonna call the Republican, uh, Republic, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, that's not gonna move the needle. Whereas if someone like, the, you know, Kevin McCarthy calls her out, right? So we, we, if we're Republicans or if we're Democrats, wherever we hear it within our own camp, encourage our elected officials that, that are in the same party as us to be the one to bring those those people to account. I think that's really the best way we'll, we'll be able to lower the levels within politics and within the halls of Congress. Okay, next question. And this is this is an excellent one, I think. Who are American anti-Semites today? Is there a pattern or can anyone be an anti-Semite? And I don't think that they're asking about filling out a membership application. I think they're just trying to ask you to kind of parse the spectrum in the United States. Um, who would like to go first? If only it was that easy that we could just that they wore that anti semite on their yeah. on their their vest. Oh, yeah. we, we would yeah. we would know that we would need to stay away or, or can't yeah. convince can't convince that that person. Um, David, I use this quote a lot, but David Nuremberg at the University of Chicago has this quote that anti semitism is part of the grammar of the West, and and we talk about normalization. And I do think that there are probably many Americans who have some biases towards Jews, and it's not. It's out of ignorance or it's 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 unrealized but it's it's familiar and i wouldn't necessarily put those i wouldn't label those people anti-semites you know i i do personally reserve anti-semites for the worst of the worst um you know the the self-proclaimed the white nationalists the, the white supremacists um but when people engage in it consistently and especially even on the far left um and and what, what it is it, it amounts to something that's anti-semitic um, you can call that out because that's problematic, that's anti-Semitic. Um, I'm a little, I am careful on using the word anti-Semites, but I would say really kind of the three main categories today. We have, you know, far right white supremacists, you know, neo-Nazis. We've got, you know, even anarchists, um, far leftists, like even like very far out progressives that are so vehemently anti-Israel that it does cross that line into anti-Semitism. And we still have, we have religious extremists in our country, whether they're Christian extremists or Islamist extremists. We had issues with the Black Hebrew Israelite movement uh, with the Jersey City um, uh, killings in December 2019. So I would put really those three. Those are the main three areas where we see anti-Semites 
um, you know, kind of living today. Okay. Uh, Brian or Yair, anything you'd like to add? Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, and this builds on, on what you were just talking about, Holly. Um, this is, Holly, earlier you said that not everyone who says something anti-Semitic is an anti-Semite, and you just said it again. Can you explain more about what you mean, and should we deal differently with those two things? Oh, such a good, it's such a good question. Okay, so um, Brian knows this, um, but I, I come at this from a, a personal place. Um, when I was young, so I should start by having a disclaimer that I'm, I'm not Jewish. I'm a practicing Christian. I have grown up um, in, in Southern California and my, my grandparents were from Mississippi, a Baptist family. Like this is kind of my reality. And I had, my best friend was Jewish growing up and five years old, six years old. I kind of repeated something I learned in Sunday school about, you know, something in a, in a you know, kind of Christian anti-Judaism, anti, anti not realizing it, ignorance. At, at, like, at its core level. And there are, and I really didn't learn about the Holocaust until I was in college. I didn't learn about 2000 years of Christian anti-Judaism which at the stage of the Holocaust until I was in college. And I went you know, through public schools in California. And there's so much ignorance out there and people do say these things. And I think when we scare young people, when we really punish them, I think there's ways of educating them in a way that we don't call them anti-Semitic. And I only say this because I think I was one of them not knowing it for a long time. And so I think there's like ways to call out anti-Semites when they know what they're doing, when they're, they're, they're well-versed in it, they're, they're openly proclaiming it, it's consistent, um, it's, it's hateful words that are inciting violence. Like that's, it's, it's a little bit easier to do that. I would be careful again on, on the, the ignorance piece. And, and that's where the education comes in, which I think was a theme that we've heard throughout the night of continuing to educate, continuing to, to, meet, to meet Jewish people. And uh, that, the, 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 the meeting Jews that um, Yair mentioned is so important. There's other um, countries actually that have the same similar thing. Germany has a program called Rent a Jew, which sounds horrible in English, but I think in German it sounds better. But it is the idea of sending Jews out to communities that don't know them and, and, and interacting and breaking down that ignorance and, and, and some of those presumptions. Yeah, I, I would like to just add to it because I, I was very glad that somebody asked about it and that you got to explain it because I think that the difference between someone being anti-Semitic or saying or believing anti-Semitic things is a hugely, hugely important distinction that is all pretty much completely lost on places like social media, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, and in our public discourse, people jump immediately to, you said something anti-Semitic, you aren't anti-Semite. Um, but I think people can understand this in a totally different context, which is that it's not making some special allowance for people who have blind spots about Jewish people or ignorance about Jewish people. I think we all know in our own lives that we have had blind spots about minority communities and people we didn't know very much about and didn't encounter very much, if at all. Um, and I have been grateful that throughout my life, over time, I've had some of those blind spots filled in graciously and generously by other people who recognized that I was not a bad person. I simply did not have that experience. Um, and that's going to be an ongoing process throughout my life. And we need to create a space for people to do that and to grow, just as people have throughout the years and centuries. Um, what has created a certain challenge to this way of life is, I think, in some sense, social media, which one thing is extremely uh, brief, uh, which means there is a space to explain a complex thing, like I just said. You were, I ran out of characters around two minutes ago. Um, and so you're just an anti-Semite and that's it, right? But then the more, uh, the more serious reason why it's a problem is because imagine somebody did say something anti-Semitic because they grew up in a community where those were stereotypes that floated around and they didn't really know Jewish people and they lacked the education. Um, so they tweeted it and they were 12, right? Or they were 14. Uh, and now they're 21 or 22 and they're about to enter the job market and somebody digs this up and puts it out there, right? And it's a screenshot and it lives forever on the internet. Right, so they are forever reduced to their worst moment and their least evolved self and their, with their biggest blind spots. I don't think very many people could actually survive that for long. Um, and I don't think that's how humans develop or grow, uh, but we often use the internet and social media records and histories um, and other things like this as ways to stunt people's growth and to freeze them in time. Uh, and that doesn't help anyone. And it certainly doesn't help Jews when we're fighting anti-Semitism because you know, as we've said, Jews are an extraordinarily tiny population. Uh, and we need all the help we can get and all the allies we can get. And finding ways to draw the circle smaller and smaller rather than grow it bigger and bigger isn't ultimately our best interest at all. Okay, Brian? You know, uh, one thing that's going on now, which I think is so interesting, is, is like this debate about what to do with hate crime laws, for instance. And, and I always have to remind people that 
when we're talking about prejudice, there's different strata of depth and there's also different directions. Sometimes the direction is, uh, I don't wanna say laser focused because we're uh, the Jewish space laser thing, but sometimes it's more focused on Jews and sometimes it's something more amorphous about just you know, a general hatred of which, oh, we'll throw Jews in there along with BLM and the socialists and everyone else. Um, and I think you, you, you can't have a one size fits all. And the other thing too, that I think is, uh, that, that is not great about what's going on uh, in, in our ways of combating uh, prejudice is, is exactly what you said. In other words, can we have a little space for people to mess up? And can, and, and, and can we say, again, like Holmes said, there's a difference between being kicked and stumbled upon. I'm not saying that we should have like a certain tolerance for, you know, 8% uh, fructose anti-Semitism versus 55% or whatever it is. But, but the bottom line is, I think there's not a one size fits all when we're dealing with manifestations of prejudice. And, and, and because not some, someone might repeat something that's anti-Semitic, but because, but emotionally, there's something about it that resonates uh, about how unfair a general system is or something. And they say, well, you know what? Uh, guess what? There, there are poor Jews too, or there are Jews that believe in this or that. Uh, there's a way to approach this that doesn't have to always be punitive. Mm -hmm. So just, just to sum up, I think some of the strategies and some of the, the kind of important points that, that you all explored in our conversation this evening, you're saying that, that education, communication, allyship, familiarization with Jews, you know, get to know people outside of your immediate bubble and your immediate comfort zone. Beyond that, don't be afraid to report, uh, to, to work with the, within the political system, to work with, with your local law enforcement, but also to give each other grace when you encounter these things, if it isn't a direct, you know, somebody somebody looking to to, to, to take a physical a physical swipe at you, and I would put to, to to you that that these don't just work for combating and dealing with anti-Semitism. They work for combating and dealing with 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 racism um, and and prejudice and a whole a whole series of of of, of these kinds of of, of issues. Um, and it was just wonderful to, to have it kind of laid out for, for everybody who's, who's been with us this evening to hear. So I would like to thank the three of you, Brian Levin, Holly Hofnagel, and Yaya Rosenberg for joining us. Um, thank you for sharing your, your expertise and your time. Uh, Yair, the, uh, the unpacked six-part series that you're doing on anti-Semitism, the museum will be adding to its toolkit on anti-Semitism. Uh, for those who are, who are participating this evening, if you go to our website, dhhrm.org, and then you can search the term anti-Semitism toolkit, it will come up. Just give us six weeks until they've all been released. Um, and again, thank you all so very much for, for joining us, and I would like to thank uh, the uh, participants in this in this uh, series overall for for having stuck with us through, through through these four months as as we've had a chance to explore all of this. So thank you so much for joining us. Very much appreciated. Thank, thank you for you, having sir. us.